like me can do something to help? Can I really change how this ends? I feel sort of... confident. More at ease. Wouldn't that be something? It'd be like one of those stories where love and courage triumph and stuff. A lot of thinking has been done about desire in the course of human history, from ancient Greece where locomotion was acquired through desire itself, to classic religious philosophy where desire is the root of all suffering, to the modern world where debate surged over the morality of one's own desire. The leap from philosophy to anime may seem like whiplash to some, but the debate of desire is something inseparable from the 2012 anime Monica Magica. In this world, miracles are real. Certain girls are granted a singular wish, in exchange for a guaranteed fate that they become magical girls, using their power to fight witches, the source of most evil. It centers on a group of five of these girls, primarily Monica Kaname and Sayaka Miki, the two who struggle over this decision and what to wish for. Monica has the essentially perfect life, and doesn't desire much outside of a solution to her perceived personal weakness. Saika is similar, but instead of weakness, she grapples with selfishness. Why does she hold an unrequited love for Kiyosuke, and would it be right to heal the wounds which stole his purpose? What will they learn from their mentor Mami, the rival Kyoko, and the mysterious Homura? Over time, the seemingly shoujo nature of their world crumbles, revealing secrets, lies, despair, and tragedy as they make their wishes and come to terms with the results, none of which end happily as expected. From here on out, we'll have some pretty major spoilers. Because the world is built on wishes, I don't believe it can be separated from the philosophy of desire. As always, I'm no expert on the subject, but just someone with an interest, and so what I'll be putting forward here is something I've interpreted from the series. Now, I believe at the heart of a wish is an attempt at completion. That is, the human desire to be our true and final selves, to be complete. It is to know who we are and who we love, what our past was for and how it's going to shape our future, what we want and what we can live without, and so on. I believe this because the complete human has no desire. They have achieved all that is necessary and their existence needs no further supplementation from other things, from people, goods, places, or anything like that. Adding more would simply be to admit one was not complete in the first place. Obviously, this isn't an attainable state. One of the largest reasons is that within completion, there is a rejection of change. The world around us changes and in turn shapes us with it as well. Even if we resist that change, completion still only exists within context. Let's say, for an example, you find completion in the company of someone who sadly passes. Then without any shift on your part, your completion would cease to be as it always would in that situation. As such, it's relying on the past and that was made in a former space and former time and it needs those things to maintain itself, it needs them to be. Furthermore, humans only desire that which we have experienced or known someone else to experience. Lots of wishes are thrown around in the series, from being a millionaire to a simple cake. However, no one wishes for this, and that's because it's random nonsense I typed on a keyboard. It could be something, maybe in the future it will be, but a lack of experience makes it essentially nothing. It's like the setup in Plato's Allegory of the Cave, a story of prisoners who only witness shadows on a wall for their entire lives, while the world plays out around them casting those shadows. They exist in the world, however could never wish for more than a shadow, because that's all they know of this world. As such, desire itself, not just completion, is inherently tied to the past. This means that wishes are as well. So I say a wish is a reach for the complete because they are a desire to gain something. Further, they are against the future and based in our past due to the nature of experience and longing. I don't think there's reason to argue this as almost every character's wish involves a return to the past. Saika wishes to heal Kyosuke's wounds so he can play the violin once again, as he did before. Kyoko wishes for her father's sermons to be populated again, as they once were. Homer wishes to meet Monica again with more strength to protect her, and this is a literal specific moment in the past. And Mommy, even in her forced decision in facing death due to a car crash, seeks the past in wishing to live. We can apply two terms to accompany wishing, those being regret and nostalgia. Regrets are a mismatch between our own attempted completeness and the world around it. They're anything in the past which leads us to further have desire. Nostalgia is placing a changed version of oneself upon a static version of the past. It's sort of like looking back and thinking, this situation with that change could have been perfect. 
so we can put together a comprehensive sentence. Wishes are an attempt at completion, approximations of the past fueled by regrets, what went wrong, and how we think it could have gone right, which is nostalgia. So let's look at their wishes again. Saika wishing to heal Kiyosuke does change the future, but this change is a desire to return to the past. In looking for love, his accident is what went wrong, her regret, and if it never happened, he may have loved her, which is her nostalgia. Kyoko is similar, wanting to return to the happy family life that was lost. Her father's sermons are what went wrong, and everyone listening is how it could have gone right. For Homura, Monica's death is what went wrong, and her being strong enough to protect her is how it could have gone right. Desire is inherently linked to the past. We seek through our experiences to create something which feels like the perfect us. However, this just becomes a cycle because the present is constantly becoming the past as we in the world change. Every experience has the potential to become a regret, even good ones as we look back on them from a new context. We haven't achieved completion even after attempting to correct our regrets, and so our nostalgia has been proved wrong. This leads every single step back in on itself, each regret being failed by nostalgia and becoming a regret itself, until eventually these feelings conflict and we reach a form of despair. We have no true self, all attempts at completion were failures and become regrets, and our nostalgia has completely emptied. Despite breaking free from a vicious cycle, this state itself is far worse. Regrets and nostalgia serve a purpose. While they're against growth when used in full force, a healthy amount of each encourages it to some degree. When used healthfully, they keep us up with the world, what we want to maintain and what we don't, and what we seek to find and what we lack. Desire was selected into us because it promotes survival and growth. Losing these things is the end of one's being as it's known. In the series, this is where witches are born. The harsh truth of the Monica magical world is that these sworn enemies of magical girls are actually just magical girls who fall into despair. Unable to cope with their selves and the results of their wish, their soul gems, the containers for their soul which cloud from the use of magic in despair, break and overflow. They lose themselves entirely and only seek to inflict pain and suffering. Now we can get into the specifics of why this is a guaranteed fate for magical girls. As most of us have probably experienced, some dreams die, we realize that we were wrong, that we don't know ourselves as well as we thought, and we have to move on. That is the process of being human and having desire. However, magical girls don't have the luxury of moving on as they sign a contract for their powers. The wish is granted on the stipulation that they fight witches, enforced by the fact that the only way to cleanse one's soul gem is through grief seeds, items left behind by defeated witches. This codifies their wish, the very purpose of their being is forever tied to the cost of their desire, and it's something they can never escape. For a moment, they do achieve completion, via regret and nostalgia fused with the magic of a miracle they make a situation which feels perfect. We see this with Sayaka, when Kyosuke plays the violin again for the first time, it's exactly what she wished for, and as she states, There's no way I'll ever regret it, and right now, this is the happiest moment of my life. It's such a picturesque scene for a reason. Bathed in golden light, it's the moment where everything was as it was willed to be. We could also point to Kyoko's temporary happiness at her father's success, even as she was fighting witches, or when Homura first reverses her timeline to meet Monica again, overjoyed that she can relieve the past with an even better chance. But in all of this, a conflict arises because, as we said, both they and the world will attempt to change. Because their wish locked a single desire, they're faced with an impasse. But once constituted their completion, will no longer do so because the context has changed. We see this in all of them. Saika learned the truth of her being, that her soul is detached from her body and placed in the gem, and she doesn't see a zombie as someone Kyoko... Kyoko? <laughs> Accidentally push a fucking ship, Jesus. And she doesn't see a zombie as someone Kyosuke could love. Further, her and Madoka's friend Hitomi declares an ultimatum. If Saika does not ask him out, then she will instead. In this, we can see that both Saika and the world around her have changed, but her wish cannot because it was contractual. The soul gem serves as a good representation of all of this. Being literally locked in a cage, never allowed to grow, change, or truly interact with the world, this is the representation of the magical girl. That is, until they fall to despair and it overwhelms the cage and escapes in a glut of energy. 
As Kyubei explains, he makes these contracts knowing the girls turn to witches because the energy released in the transformation helps solve entropy, preventing the heat death of the universe. A few lives are sacrificed for the eternity of everything. So it stands to reason that in this instant where it breaks, this is the energy of an entire life, one that was held back, being released. Everything they never got to live due to a codified desire. If each life constitutes the same energy, then everything they would never get to live because of their wish exists here in this release. Naturally, as an exploration of this principle, the cast each presents a reaction to this situation. To try and avoid crushing reality of their specifics, they're faced with either making themselves static and rejecting the world's change, making the world static and rejecting oneself, rejecting both the world and oneself, or simply accepting it all. But that's only four and there's five magical girls to cover. You may have noticed that Mommy has been mentioned only sparingly so far, and that's because she's less a part of the lesson and more so the groundwork for it, fitting with her role in the series overall. Every other character contemplates the decision which then dictates their fate, where Mommy's was a chance decision which simply extended hers. The victim of a fatal car crash, her family perished and she made a contract with Kyubei to avoid the certain death before her. This is a choice where no one would have considered otherwise, because it's the moment where regret and nostalgia are both one and the same. Before certain death, the absolute finality of life, one only has memories which are more fond than this current situation and regrets the end of all of them. Completion becomes nothing when faced with desolation. As such, Mommy is able to continue living in the most bare sense. She has no family or friends. She has one singular fate, which is fighting witches and nothing else. Her life is given to the bare processes of living and nothing more. As she tragically says to Madoka, When I'm scared or hurt, there's no one I can talk to. All I can do is cry on my own. But then this also protects her from the ultimate despair, as she never becomes a witch. When one is living like the dead, there is no future, there's only continuation. There's nothing to contrast the past against creating regret or nostalgia. She has experienced the worst of all things. Mommy does meet her end eventually though, just as she nears convincing Monica and Sayaka to become magical girls with her. Finding companionship for the first time in her recent life, she grows overconfident and perishes to a sneak attack, one Homura desperately tried to warn her about. Thematically, this is the moment Mommy regained a future which wasn't allowed. For all things to balance out as they do, this had to be corrected. But she stands as the baseline. She shows the extent of nostalgia and regret. She shows how one can live without finding despair, but asks if we really want to given its static nature, and she embodies the cost associated with wishful thinking. Saika is the one we've discussed the most so far and will continue along that line. To quickly restate, her regret was Kyosuke's injury. Her nostalgia was that if it didn't happen, he could have loved her. She becomes complete with the hope this change brings before both she and the world change, leaving her contractually bound self at odds with her new self and the world. She is the case of making oneself static and rejecting the world. Now, to clarify this, no one can truly be static. If the world changes, we must respond to it, even in minuscule ways. What it really means is how we define ourselves becomes something we refuse to actively change. She sinks into the idea of the ideal magical girl, one left behind in the legacy of Mommy, and becomes obsessed with the justice it represents, hating everything which does not fit that definition. I also shouldn't state the regret of her wish, because she tries to prove it otherwise, saying to Kyoko, And I've decided that from now on, I'm never gonna regret anything. Having already mentioned the purpose of regret, naturally we know danger follows such a mindset. She will never grow or change for the better again. The statement is saying that whatever the case or reason, she will maintain her complete self, the one who made the wish, even if it's unhealthy. As we witness, doing so amounts to locking herself in a box and hating the world which proves her wrong at every turn, refuting the past she clings to. Her nostalgia becomes a regret, but she tries to believe otherwise by looking tangentially at the feeling of justice and stealing her desire for it even more. But one word gives away how this fails. Desire. To desire proves she isn't complete, and this contradiction is her despair. And what she wanted, justice, is something that itself can never lead to completion. It relies on us and others, our interactions and how they define the state of the world around us. It's something which never finishes. Her choice was endless toil. 
Every step she takes past her realization is another step closer to breaking, to ignoring the truth until it's too late, as she does. She sits alone, found by Kyoko, just as she's lost all nostalgia and is consumed by regret. She turns into a witch, the quintessential story of becoming what one hated. Her story states, without question, more than just being careful with desire, but being careful because our desire depends on others. Kyoko, despite having a very similar start to the story of her wish, ends in a much different direction. She also becomes an agent of completion for someone else and then seeks her own through theirs, and in this case, it's her father. After she wishes for his crowds to return to his sermons, they do. In this, he serves as a micro example of completion. He sought to update religious teachings for a new world, something which went against others' desire for nostalgia. He was challenging the completion of others they found in religion, and he was scorned for doing so. Kyoko even realizes this fact, saying it just wasn't what they were used to hearing. So she makes her wish for them to listen, and through her daughter, Kyoko's father succeeds. However, the people were only listening because of her wish, which means he himself was having no actual impact, which is what he wanted for true completion. She misunderstood his desire, even after recognizing the principle which caused all their pain. In this disconnect, he finds despair, one which can't be solved because Kyoko locked the nostalgia in, but in a way which he finds no value. He stuck with this decision someone else made, faced with despair as any of our other characters are. He finds the only way out to be suicide, but not before killing his wife and second daughter, leaving Kyoko entirely alone. This builds off of Sayaka, showing just how complex the web of desires can be, but it also does more. It shows how different our reactions to such things can be. She moves on a lot better than most others. Where they all constantly struggle to prevent regret from overtaking their wish, she essentially allows it to, understanding fully that she made a mistake. But she lives the same as Sayaka in a stasis of self-maintenance. Kyoko discards her entire being, which was formerly devoted to helping others, and reverses to being defined wholly by selfish desire like her constant gluttony. Where they differ is in how personal this makes their completion. Sayaka's could never be fully personal, Kyoko's easily is, it is her and her existence, nothing more. Justice is an act of the many, gluttony an act of one. With all this in mind, she's also like Mommy in lacking a true future, only hers doesn't exist because she doesn't desire one, she has no need for change. She has rejected herself and the world in this isolation, seemingly achieving a state of completion. She doesn't desire more than what's needed for survival, and she won't ever fall to despair because of this. But by cutting herself off, is this even living? If the solution is to discard ourselves, then is it even worthwhile? It's just admitting the same fact as everyone else, that we didn't know ourselves, that our entire being was overcome with regret, but deleting it and starting completely new to compensate. I think we can see a stress of this when she and Madoka discuss bringing Sayaka back to life. Kyoko states, The reason I became a magical girl was because I love stories like those. Can't believe I forgot that. And Sayaka was the one who reminded me. Kyoko didn't even remember who she was before. But suddenly, she begins to return to it, her past self still existing within her and the completion she found in her new self begins to fall apart. Saika made her want to help once again, reminded her of her past, and brought back a girl once discarded. Her nostalgia returned from her newfound friend, making her fail like any other. She dies trying to bring Saika back, an act of clinging to the past. Whether this is her old self or her new one is murky, but what we see is a time where nostalgia, rather than regret, led to her downfall. It can never truly be discarded. These feelings are what constitute us. Homura is the opposite of Sayaka in what she maintains and what she rejects. The latter was trying to save a state of herself, the former is trying to save a state of the world. This is quite literal, as I like to stress, she specifies to meet Madoka again not to be with her. This indicates a more exact point in time, the one where she felt the most complete. For Homura, this was easy. Her entire past before Madoka was regrets. She had no skills, no friends, and no direction. The first good thing in her life is Madoka. Because of this, she only has one source for nostalgia, the titular magical girl herself. So when attempting to find a complete state, she tries to fulfill all of her regret with that single point of joy. I think this is part of what really leads her to obsession. It's also then very fitting that her powers allow her to relive the same few months again and again indefinitely because that's the only way she can prevent the outside world from shifting and ruining her internal world. 
She needs everyone and everything to remain exactly as it is because she only has that one single nostalgia. Any single shift could destroy that and lead her right back to despair, the point where we have no nostalgia and only regret, the thing she felt just before Monica. This is delivered in her lines saying things like, Don't change. Stay as you are, Madoka Kaname. Stay as you are. Forever. However, this leads her to drastically changing, going from a shy introvert to the mysterious and brooding transfer student. It destroys her relationship with Madoka, who's still receptive but shocked by her cold demeanor. She has maintained her nostalgia, but not herself. So what is she really left with then? Paradoxically, the future itself has become Homer's regret, and she's living purely in nostalgia. This is what the entirety of the movie Rebellion is. The end of the original series sees Monica finally making a wish, that being to prevent witches from ever appearing. This removes her being from the world as she's forever bound to be the laws of the universe itself and save magical girls directly. Unable to cope, Homer becomes a witch anyway due to Kyubei locking her out from the rest of the world, and she creates a world of nostalgia in her labyrinth. None of Monica's friends have died there, there's no witches, just nightmares the girls can recover from, and they all live happily and relatively peacefully. Even more than before, she has lost her sense of self to the world around her. They are one and the same. As such, Homer presents no solution either, but a warning of just how powerful nostalgia can be. If you've seen one of these discussions before, it's no secret that Monica Kaname presents the ideal. She wishes not for the past, not to correct a mistake, and takes the full cost of her desire onto her being. She pays for what she gains and accepts it as the new laws of this universe. I don't need to go over all these points again just to say she found completion in her wish, that much is obvious. And because none of us will ever have that kind of power, I can't draw an approximation of how we could do the same. And I think that's the point here today. To be complete, she had to perfectly manage her regret and her nostalgia, keep things entirely focused on changing only herself, but also for the fate of the world, altering the past, present, and future alike. It's an impossible task. As such, we can confirm what we already knew, that completion is Sisyphean. It may appear done, but will always reveal itself to be the opposite. Monica is perfect because we cannot be Monica. But we can go deeper into who she is, or rather more accurately, why she is. How did she become the kind of person to break free from this cycle? Naturally, this means looking at the conditions in which she was raised, so for the first time ever, let's see what Monica's mom Junko can add to the conversation. The description her husband offers is the best place to start. When Monica asks him about her dreams and why she works so hard, he responds, Working at that company might not necessarily have been her dream, but the way your mom's living her life is actually kind of perfect for her. The way she's living her life. What we can see in this is an injection of realism into the idea of completion. It's focusing not on specific points or things in your life, but rather what you're seeking to accomplish from them. It adds a range to the idea of being complete, recognizing that we can never find an ideal state, but we can get within and maintain a certain distance from it. As long as we don't tie ourselves to those singular points, that is, as long as we don't create our own contract, we can keep evolving with the world and our own senses of self. And there's probably no one who has to do that more than a parent. Having a child becomes both your past, present, and future. It shapes the entire course of your life, and you dedicate the years to come to improving theirs. Their future can even become part of your desire. But there's no way for such a thing like that to be rigid. The child is going to be influenced by the world around them as you once were and still are. They'll like different things and want to go to different places and there will be disconnects neither side will understand. We see this in Monica Magica. As Homer fights Valpurgis Noct, a witch with apocalyptic power, the outside world sees it as a mix of natural disasters all at once. Knowing the truth, Monica tries to run out into the storm, content that she's going to make a wish to save Homura, who's been living in an endless loop of time trying to win this battle and save Monica. Junko obviously stops her, but after Monica explains the importance of the situation, even without any specifics, she lets her daughter go, trusting that she raised someone who will make the right decision. And in accepting that Monica can make a right decision that she may not be aware of, she acknowledges also that the girl she raised herself is not complete. She has things that she needs to do to grow and change and fall within the range Junko herself already has. She doesn't hold people to the past, but embraces the ones who will make her future. 
Now, of course, we have to make more than just a passing mention of her lack of contract. She's not a magical girl and as such was able to shift her sense of self to accommodate because there was nothing directly lacking her in as those contracts are. She doesn't know the exact same pain that they do. This is something we can't translate directly to reality. Monica Magica is a story which takes place at the extremes of the human mind, presenting cases which test the bitter ends of the human condition. As such, the most we can do is examine what a contract might look like in our world, how we may lock our beings with regret and nostalgia against the world. It's much less defined than in their world. It isn't a single moment we can point to, a single time we sign, but rather many more. It's electives we take in high school that lead to the course we study in college, to the first job which gives us the experience that then follows us into the rest of our career. It's in the moments of our first love and the pain and joy it brought us and leaves us with as we try to avoid and seek the former and latter once again. It's how we spend our free time, the feelings that we are chasing in it. This may be the pessimist way of viewing the world, but it's always seemed to be this kind of shape to me. Based on our past, our possibilities become more selective, maybe more vivid within those spaces, but with less spaces overall. Nothing in this world is fully closed off. I can't say apply to be a psychologist with an engineering degree and expect success. And maybe that degree was my attempt at completion before, and now I see it as false. Sure, I have the option to change, but for a lot of time and a lot of money. This is our contract, one with many more clauses and options, a lot of fine print, but a binding one to the past nonetheless. Life is a series of making mistakes and then dealing with the consequences. We're all going to feel regret, we're all going to feel the pull of nostalgia, and none of us will truly be complete. The most we can do is be aware of who we are and who we want to be, and find such things within reason that is applying range to completion. To add my own spin onto the end of things, I don't believe this constitutes simply making peace with the world around us, especially if the world is what you find making yourself lack completion. I think fighting to change things is a part of all this because changing the world can also change things within that range. It can make the world better or worse or anything in between. So we must not face this task with simple resignation, but with vigor. I understand the desire to be what feels as one's true self as quickly as possible. My entire past two months have been racked with anxiety because of that feeling. Unfortunately, our world doesn't acquiesce to it. If we want to find it, we must be realistic and continue onward, or else we'll only look back on our days with regret, our nostalgia will run dry, and we'll be left to despair. And I don't want to see a single person out there fall to despair. If I can ask you one thing, it's to keep going for me because I'm selfish and I'm too weak to witness the pain of others without feeling it myself. That's why when people compliment me on my Sayaka video, I say it's simply me examining myself. I relate to her because other people's pain, I, I feel weak and not being able to handle it. So let's keep going together. I'll leave you with a few important links in the pinned comment. Twitter, not the most important. Discord, a little bit more important. This was actually the spot where it kind of got its legs. They helped me refine the idea over there and turn it into something that I think was a lot more polished. So a big thanks to my Discord on this one. And the most important link is my Patreon, where these lovely people above support me directly, helping me keep doing this thing I love to do. But anyway, I'll say thank you for watching, and I hope I'll see you again soon.